I would like to give Dr. Flory the opportunity to respond to Dr. Salvatierra, and we can perhaps have some dialogue between our two panelists. So, Dr. Flory. Thanks, Christine and, and Alexia, for a thoughtful response. And I love, uh, Alexia, the story of subverting the Minutemen through prayer. Uh, that's <laughs> that's sort of above and beyond, I think. So I have a couple of thoughts in response, but first I want to briefly touch on two areas that I think uh, I did, that I did not include in my presentation, just to, just to include them for your thinking as this conference particularly starts off. First, and Christine just mentioned this, is that I did not specifically mention LA and Pentecostalism in my presentation, but yes, as a sign over on San Pedro and Azusa Street says, LA is the cradle of the worldwide Pentecostal movement. But that, that being said, there is, um, there is argument among historians of Pentecostalism about the origins of the global movement. Uh, in, in the chat, there's a link to a book called Spirit and Power that uh, colleagues of mine and I edited several years ago, uh, looking at the, the, the growth and impact of global Pentecostalism. And we have two essays at the beginning of the book, one by uh, Alan Anderson and one by uh, Fuller Professor uh, Mel Robeck, that, that illustrate this. You have to read the, the chapters, but I love Mel's uh, metaphor for Pentecostalism coming from Los Angeles, that it's LA is the cue ball in a perfect billiard break and everything essentially comes back to LA. Um, so take a look at that, those articles, uh, those chapters in that book. Secondly, about borders and borderlands. Now I did not put this in my presentation, but I think, and I was looking at the, the calendar of speakers, there's a few that are coming up that have to do with borders and borderlands. I think that's a really important issue and something that helps us think about Los Angeles and culture. If we start with a different definition of LA than what I presented this morning, from Mike Davis's book, City of Courts, LA for Davis stretches from, and here's the quote, from the country club homes of Santa Barbara to the shanty colonias of Ensenada. That's the end of the quote, which then obviously includes and extends beyond the US-Mexican border. That's LA for Davis. So borders and borderlands are liminal spaces in which people, geographies, identities, and cultures mix. LA can be thought of as a borderland. Uh, Juan Martinez, which will be in the next presentation, has written about Latino Pentecostal churches and pastors who regularly navigate international borders in their, as he calls them, transnational lives. These churches effectively exist both here and there, with here and there being relative to which side of the border you might be on. So that, and, and one chapter that, that Juan has written, he's written a lot about this, is in that book that on spirit and power. Uh, another book is coming out uh, next year on religion in LA, interestingly enough. Um, uh, Jonathan Calvillo has a chapter in it. He's uh, from Boston University. He focuses on a local church in Santa Ana that also illustrates this borderlands idea where they draw on century old streams of Latinx Protestantism, but then combine them with more recent expressions. But they're also deeply rooted in their local uh, position in Santa Ana, but they are, but are part of this transnational Pentecostal network. So the liminality for this church is both historical, they go back in time and combine that with the current area, and there it's geographic. So I think both of those examples give us an idea of the cultural liminality and mixture that's part of what makes Los Angeles, Los Angeles. And understanding how cultures continually can come together and mix, that is they don't just do it once, but this is a constant overturning and, and renegotiating what it means to be in this location of Los Angeles. It's an important part of understanding the city and in turn provides a context for how religious groups act and believe and practice. Now, to my responses to Alexia's, uh, to my response to Alexia's response, anyway. Um, I think Alexia brings up an interesting point about social changes in California in general and LA in particular that have been happening over the last couple of decades. And to, for just one example, she brings up uh, Prop 87, 187 in 1994 to today represents significant change. I remember uh, the 2006 immigration demonstrations in downtown LA. I was teaching a class at the time called Postmodern Metropolis, Los Angeles being one of our locations, uh, uh, Tijuana another one. Um, but it's important to keep in mind the larger picture that these kinds of advances are always challenged as they have been recently, as we all know. My point in talking about the two sides of pluralism is to be realistic about Los Angeles, that it isn't all openness and opportunity, but that it has a pretty dark history, particularly on issues like racial inequality and oppression, 
and that some of these impulses are still alive and active. And you don't have to go very far to find those places. And out of, many of them are alive and well and, and primarily white, but not exclusively white, evangelical and Pentecostal churches. Um, further, how we define LA is important. Scholars generally agree that the five county definition that I use in my presentation is right, but this formulation tends to gloss over variation across different places within this larger metropolis. So it'd be important to understand the relative degree of support or opposition to immigration reform or any other sort of social issue that comes across, from across the different geographies in greater Los Angeles, regardless what laws are passed in Sacramento. For example, we've seen how local police departments actually uh, resist following SB 54 that, uh, that Alexia mentioned that limits cooperation between local police and federal, federal immigration agents. So there's a law, but the local law enforcement isn't really following it all, all the time. Depends where you are. And I think that's an important thing, not just to mention, but to see where that happens and why that happens in those different ways, because that's also part of the, of the LA complex. And I would also find this particularly interesting in terms of how local congregations, meaning both the official position, whether that's the congregation or its denomination, or what its members, attenders, and leaders think about different issues related to immigration as well as important issues. This, there's gonna be variation within congregations and across congregations and across locations in Los Angeles. So how does that play out, particularly for this conference in terms of, of the Christian church? What do they look like? How do they how do they approach things? How do they embrace these issues of social equity? Finally, to, but to bring it back to the general category in which I think I would place Alexia's comments, that of religion and civic culture, that is the role of the faith community in the public sphere. The, role, the faith community has changed significantly in recent decades, and we can really point back to 1992, which uh, Alexia mentioned, and the social unrest following the acquittal of the police officers and the beating of Rodney King. That's when LA's faith communities really decided that they needed to be more present and active in the public life of the city. The efforts across faith communities to quote, heal LA, which was the mantra at the time, were extensive. There was lots of relationships and, and networks that were developed. And most of those disappeared after a few years, but their legacy was used and built on to see much of what we see today in terms of faith-based organizers, faith-based uh, community development corporations and the like. Not to say that there's a, necessarily those caused the latter, but, that, but that, those efforts created a broader context within which the public religious groups pushed themselves into the public sphere and on the, on the government side, the local leader side, they realized they needed the voice of the faith leader in that. So, so a crisis develops this kind of, uh, kind of opportunity. Uh, there are a couple of uh, links in the chat for you from the books that I mentioned earlier, but also uh, two reports from our center at USC, the Center for Religion and Civic Culture. First is called Politics of the Spirit, and that details the initial efforts of all the groups that came together in the immediate aftermath of, of the 92 unrest. And then in around, I think it was published, we, we put it out in, a, in 1911, it's called Forging, that, that was called Politics of the Spirit. And a primary player in that is Reverend Chip, Chip Murray. And Chip Murray is a key religious leader in Los Angeles. He's now 90 year, 91 years old, I believe. Uh, and I miss seeing him every day at work because of Zoom, but that's the way life is these days. Um, so he, that's, that's an important document to read and it's online at that link. You can download it, share it, uh, use it in your work or, in, or whatever your work is. And then the second report, we followed up with this almost 10, not quite 10 years later. And that report is called Forging a New Moral and Political Agenda. And it takes into account the very beginnings of what Alexi was talking about in terms of what this sort of the initial effort kind of goes its way because people get in, in, involved in other things, but then new groups come up. For example, Pico, uh, LA Voice, uh, Pico, and then One LA really came online in the in in the form we know them now. In their, it, it, they really didn't come in online until the, the mid 2010s, 2004 and 2006. They were here, but not in the same way that they were then. So the the, the groundwork was laid to that to, so that they were they would be able to do this kind of public work. So those are two things you can download if, uh, free. And they're hopefully they're interesting. I was going to say they're interesting. I don't know that they are not to you. Uh, finally, um, Alexia makes a, an interesting comparison between organizing in LA and organizing in the Northeast. 
And while there are a lot of differences between the Northeast and LA, not the least weather, her comment implies what I think is an important difference particular, that's particularly significant for religion. The Northeast is much more what I would call an institutionally oriented region for religion, while LA, for lack of a better way to describe it, is much more of a self-starting, uh, just do it kind of region. In the Northeast, you need permission from institutional higher ups for new programs. In LA, you can just go out and do it. Um, I, this was brought home to me. I was working on a project with the uh, Dream Center um, and I, they had established an outpost in New York and they initially had a lot of problems finding places to put up what they were gonna do because there was so much institutional space taken up by the existing religious groups. Uh, that not so in Los Angeles, it's, it's a lot more open space. Now, again, all that is, is, is a pretty gross oversimplification, but it goes back to the fact that the lack of an established religious authority or hierarchy in, L in LA, as opposed to say in New York or Boston, where religious authority, at least in the religious world, is more important than it is here, LA is a distinct place that extends different opportunities for religion than are available in other places. And I think understanding that is important to the kinds of things that we're talking about in this the, today and also at, throughout all each of the succeeding presentations. And again, as I said in my um, presentation, I would encourage you to sort of put this lens on what the presentations are saying. Not that this explains everything, but it helps give you a context for why things are happening here in ways that they may not be happening elsewhere. The other part of this is LA, despite efforts by the federal government over the last four years, the world is, an, is a global place. Everybody's connected. And LA is particularly connected into that world for a variety of reasons. And I think it's important, if you're interested in how the religion works in the world at all, it's important to understand Los Angeles to, import, to understand the future of religion in the world. Thanks. Okay. Alexa, did you have anything to add before we move to the questions? I do. I mean, first of all, I just want to thank you for that wealth of resources, um, some of which I had never heard of. So, you know, I'm busily <laughs> writing them down. I saw you right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but there were, were a couple quick things I wanted to say. One is that I wanted to say that, of course, there's opposition to this, um, you know, what, what Dr. Pastor calls, you know, the remarkable resurgence. I mean, it's, you know, there's always opposition, including in the church, you know, until Jesus comes back, we're not going to be completely unified in any possible way. Um, but I was thinking, particularly, you were talking about, I was thinking about how robust this change has been, even in the midst of national shifts that went the other way in the church. So um, SB 54 was this uh, legislation that, that Dr. Flory, that you were talking about that some local cities resisted, right? And actually voted that they wouldn't participate. Mm -hmm. um, and so that happened in the city of Orange, that the city council actually voted that they weren't going to participate, um, that they were going to work actively with federal immigration enforcement. And so um, a number of the church leaders that had been part of the Loving the Stranger Coalition many years before, but there was a foundation that had been laid. And so Solidarity, which is a um, Christian community development affiliate, organized those pastors and leaders. And they came with signs with scriptures <laughs> and they testified and the city council reversed its decision. <laughs> Mm. So, you know, just an example of sort of how robust that shift has been in the church, in spite of all the national changes, um, that California, and some of it is connected to what you said about um, California being an inescapably global crossroads. The other thing I just wanted to mention was the way that we do interfaith differently, because I was really focusing in, of course, on the Christian story. But I think precisely because of those waves of immigration and migration and no one having a dominant voice, um, that we both do ecumenism differently and interfaith differently. So um, in Los Angeles, it's very possible to be both Catholic and Pentecostal. In fact, it's common in the Latinx community that you go to, uh, you know, you might do your quinceanera with a priest and you're a member of a Pentecostal congregation and people live with that paradox fairly comfortably. Um, the other thing that happens in uh, the interfaith context, we used to call it um, rainbow that instead of doing events, interfaith events with lowest common denominator, so you can only say a prayer that everyone agrees on, and so it has to be very bland, we would have different people offering their different um, kinds of prayer. And uh, for example, I remember very clearly 
that we were calling for repentance um, by some public authorities, publicly calling for repentance. And it was on Ash Wednesday. And we had a line of people who could come up and could get the traditional Ash Wednesday ashes. We had another line of Pentecostals who were laying hands on praying on people for repentance. And then we had another line that a rabbi was in front of and he was talking about Shuva and being willing to do the Shuva blessing for anyone who came. So that's an example of rainbow, right? That we were all there together and each of us being able to fully express our faith in our own way. So that that's um, one of the practical, tangible results of this kind of no one having a dominant voice in Los Angeles. And I, if I had more time, I could tell some really powerful stories about how that enabled us to win certain social yeah. justice fights because of the okay. different gifts of the different groups. Okay, well, we've, I, I, I'm loving this exchange, but <laughs> we, I have a queue of questions that I'm supposed to be uh, asking you. So, from that are coming through the uh, the session Q and A. So, um, let me just throw out two of them, but which are both um, research questions, uh, really data questions, just um, initially, um, but could uh, lead to some other um, interesting discussion. Um, so, the first one is about um, how many of the thousands migrating to Los Angeles are being contacted by Christian missionaries. So something about the intentional mission outreach of the churches. Um, and then the second and related one is that research is often on the larger performative churches. Um, the questioner says, it, it seems that the decentered city may mean that many small street level faith groups may be more important. So again, a question about what, what kind of research is available on that. So Dr. Flurry, would you like to have a stab at yeah, so the first? So the first question, I mean, that's the, there's always a problem of, of, of representative data. In some ways, you kind of have to give up on it and because you can't, it's, I, I don't mean that in a, in a defeatist way, but it's like you have to make do with what you can do given that research is expensive frankly, and, and to be able to pull off a big survey to find out, for example, to that first question, how many people are being reached that are immigrants? I, you know, first of all, I don't even know how you figure out what that population is because people are on the move. And so where are they and how do you locate them? So that's, a, that the data is always an issue uh, in terms of smaller versus larger. Yeah. And one reason that bigger churches tend to be studied is because they're easy to get into. Um, and and they they have a staff of thousands as people as people I've, I've interviewed have told me, and which always I love that that line, but I think that that's a good point, and that that's uh, to um, to Jonathan Calvillo's chapter that I mentioned earlier. This is a small church, and I think it's fascinating, and it links back to and Jonathan and I talked about this a lot, and I recommended him, and he had read some of Juan Martinez's work but I recommended this one chapter and that helped inform him how he was doing this. And, and this, this is a small church, but the pastor has been a, a, a minister for decades and he has extensive relationships. He's developed his own network and, and it's, they're all not, none of them are mega churches. So getting a way into smaller places as an example of larger things happening is one way to get at this issue. Uh, one story that, 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 uh, that's related to this, that, that Alexia meant, made me think about just a second ago is uh, several years ago, we were through our Murray, Cecil Murray Center, we were, had a project and uh, we were interviewing a husband, wife, African-American pastor team who had a building and a playground. There's various things going on. And because of the program, literally because of the program that we were running, the, they said, you know, we know there's this Latino church across the street and we don't really know that. And so they made it a point to go across the street, introduce themselves to the pastor, and the, the husband of the husband and wife team started going to church there and learning Spanish. And so it's like, you don't get that story from a survey. You get it from being on the ground and interviewing people and knowing people. And so I think the, other, the last piece I would say of this is utilize people that know things in the neighborhoods if you're interested in finding out what's going on, utilize people like Alexia, like people that work with her. They know things that people like me who sit in offices and do other things don't necessarily know. Um, and so then, then to go out and participate and see what's going on and see what the relationships are and see how people are motivated to do things and why people are motiv motivated to do the things they are. Putting those stories together helps illustrate this bigger issue. Whether or not you come up with the, the statistical evidence 
for this is a different question than figuring out the smaller pieces underneath, which tell the story that, that most people don't know. Can I just throw in a couple things also, Christine? Mm, please do. Um, first of all, I would really like to say that a lot of the people coming are missionaries. Mm. Right? Renee Molina came to this country undocumented, uh, came to LA from the Central America. And he says that he thinks maybe he was sent like Abraham, because when he arrived, the church had 10 members and it now has 3,000. <laughs> so I think it's very important not to just see it in that light as if the immigrants all need our evangelization. Some of them are coming to evangelize us. Mm -hmm. So um, the second thing I'd like to say is that uh, one of the things that, that partnerships really help. So the partnership, for example, that Fuller has with Matthew 25, Mateo 25, is that um, we, we have this relationship between what's going on in churches and what's going on at Fuller. And that's very intentional. In the same way, you know, we have a relationship with USC, between USC and Fuller. And so we share um, those kinds of interconnections. And I would say in general in Los Angeles, um, we're all about creative interconnections. So researchers talk to people on the ground and people in the church much more in Los Angeles than I've experienced in other places. So this kind of fluidity goes, uh, helps with that as well, which doesn't mean that we get every small church. That's right. completely unrealistic, right. That's but, impossible. but we do, um, I did my dissertation on graduates of Central Latino who are leading churches in LA. So, you know, there's a lot of spaces for partnership if you wanna be intentional about it. Mm -hmm. So actually, the next two questions are, are both about, um, uh, could be about partnership. The first is that the city of LA know, is known, as we've pointed out, for its diversity, over 200 different communities. What is an effective way to embrace these different groups into the Christian community? That's one question. And the second one is, what is the organized evangelical missional partnership? what core values guide evangelical cooperation, partnership and participation? Alexia, would you like to start with those, those questions and then Richard may have something to add. Um, sure. I think that, um, you know, the first, I'm, I'm gonna answer them practically and then Richard will do a bigger picture. Um, so in, in Matthew 25, Mateo 25 right now, we have seven support circles around the Los Angeles region. And in every one of those support circles, there are immigrant and non-immigrant churches working together, but all the support circles are actually under one heading. They're under one banner, right? That we're all connected. In fact, we're not just connected as Matthew 25. We're also, um, Matthew 25 is the lead agency for the ecumenical collaboration for asylum seekers, which is the Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Methodists, and, um, Oh my goodness, Lutherans. <laughs> Us. So, you people. <laughs> yes. So, you know, that's just a little microcosm of how part up how we already work together. That um that I'm always amazed by the different configurations in Los Angeles of how we work together across all of these very separate areas. Like West LA is completely different from East LA, and yet we have support circles in both and they're in relationship with each other. So um, that's the first question. Remind me of the second question. So, well, the, the second one was about organized evangelical partnership yes. and the core values that guide right. cooperation, partnership and participation. So there's a number of different partnerships. Um, Together LA is a more recent one. And um, Loving the Stranger, of course, was the one that I was talking about. Part of what's, um, I'm very fascinated by what creates unity in the church and the different understandings historically of what, creates unity. And part of what I think um, has built unity, has built an easier unity in the Los Angeles region than I've seen in other places between evangelical groups is our mission focus, actually. That it's what do we hear God calling us to accomplish? And so it's not, you know, going through a laundry list of all the creeds, you know, or what our core beliefs are. We're not sitting there arguing over what we think about post-millennial or pre-millennial, which we could because <laughs> we have people with very different perspectives, but we actually all work together in these coalitions across those lines because we have a core mission focus. What does God want to achieve through our collaboration? Um, so, so I think that 
that that's a different way perhaps of, of conceiving of church unity than even the traditional options. Interesting. Richard, did you want to add anything on this question or we can move, we've got more well, questions. I mean, we can yeah, yeah, just it. briefly, I think, I think the concept personally uh, and, and based on what I see uh, in other projects that the notion of an organized evangelical response is irrelevant. Um, who's organizing and who are the evangelicals organizing would be my question. I mean, there's no leader of evangelicalism. Uh, there are sort of people that, that, that get chosen to be leaders, but depending on where you are in it. So it's like, I think there are different organizations and different ways that people are organizing themselves to do this. Alexia is very representative of, of a broad range within, but that there's other, other, other ways that people are doing it as well. So I think that's kind of something and I'm not sure that's what the question meant, but that's how I heard it. it was like, here's a an evangelical way of doing this. I don't. I, I think that there's lots of different ways that are doing it. And frankly, from my perspective as a sociologist, this whole notion of denominationalism is running its course. Um, uh, no offense, but uh, um, external networks are what people are are utilizing now to get themselves organized. And, and actually, Alexia just ticked off and forgot herself in that list. Uh, that's a network. They have institutional organizational ties, but the but the real action is, isn't at the denomination for them. It's the real action is the people that that happen to identify as Lutheran or Methodist or whatever, but they're the ones in the street doing the work. So that's the, to me that's the important and interesting thing, not not the not the, the denominations who frankly are looking to figure out how they can survive in this in this world. So anyway, I think the second point would be. Uh, on, and, you, and everybody's hearing this word a lot these days. It's called, uh, people talk about authenticity. And, uh, and I've been tracking the, the use of that term for the past decade or so, and it's shifted. But nonetheless, one thing that, that committed religious people in, uh, appreciate is people who are really committed to whatever they claim their religious beliefs are. They are authentically Christian or authentically Muslim or authentically Jewish. Whatever that means, and that's that's an open question, but uh, but but uh, it kind of links back to something that, that uh, Alexia said in a previous uh, previous comment about people being you know having the multiple different kinds of you know the the Catholic uh, communion, the the laying on of hands, the shuva, you know those things all in line, you know they're all doing these things together. Being who you are religiously that allows people to talk seriously about what their beliefs and commitments and practices are in ways that you can't if it's just at this sort of upper political level. Mm, okay. So, sorry, but we're going to have to move on um, and uh, on this very interesting um, topic to quest a, a, a couple of questions relating to the um, idea of shalom that, or shalom that um, Alexia mentioned. And um, I, uh, the, the first is, is the evidence of layered diversity in LA ne necessary in order for missional minded individuals and communities to embrace this paradigm shift of cultivating shalom as mission? So this is about the layered diversity and its relationship to shalom. Um, and then the, the second related question on shalom is, um, that's um, in reference to both Middle Eastern um, African Muslims and Christians. Um, have they found their hopes and dreams fulfilled? Have they found peace, shalom or salam? Or are they surprisingly underwhelmed um, by presumably their um, encounters and experiences in Los Angeles? Alexia? <laughs> Alexia. I'm going to look to Alexia. I'm going to look to Alexia on this one. I'm I don't really know. Um, which is that please come to the panels because in the first panel, we have Salam Al Mariati, who is the Muslim Public Affairs Council director. And he's, he's going to talk about that. Like, how do, in the mosaic of Los Angeles, how, how does the Middle Eastern and Muslim community fit in? And what is their experience? And then um, the, the Excellent. I'm, I'm being told that we have to wrap up, sadly, at this point, but that's a good plug uh, for what's happening and next. Kelvin Salt's <laughs> in the second panel, so please, okay. Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Great. So um, I'd like to thank you very much indeed, Dr. Flory and Dr. Salvatierra. 
We really appreciated your rich inputs today and the way that you've also engaged one another on the topic of Los Angeles as a global crossroads. 